Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this absolutely glorious Saturday morning of uh, Alumni Week and Commencement Week and Reunion Weekend. It's wonderful to see you all. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International Affairs. I, I want to welcome you to our uh, commencement forum, Policy in Action, Getting the Relationship Between Business and Government Right. We're going to keep this as a very informal session. There's going to be some discussion with the, the panelists, but really we want to open it up to discussion with you all. So get your questions and comments ready. Uh, let, let me just say a, a few words of, of introduction. The, the topic today of, of the relationship between business and government and, and uh, getting that relationship right emphasizes in so many ways our values at Brown collectively, our, our ecumenicism about the ways in which people can affect positive change societally. They can do it through the public sector, they can do it through the NGO sector, and absolutely they can do it, pardon me, do it from the private sector. And actually I would argue that um, increasingly in recent years the private sector, for a variety of reasons, um, some having to do with the locus of innovation in so many societies being in the private sector, maybe on the less positive side, some of the governance failures that have happened in so many societies, including ours here in the United States. I think the private sector has played an increasingly important role in influencing change, in affecting policy, in responding to policy in many ways. So I couldn't think of a more important panel discussion to have than the one we're having today. Uh, there's, there's another aspect of this discussion that I really think is important to mention. All four of our panelists, who I'll introduce in a, in a moment, uh, have been students of Ross Chait, who's here in the room. Ross is a, a wonderful professor of political science and public policy. He's going to be retiring. He's retiring at the end of the year, although I hope and I know not going very far. But I, I think you'll see through the discussion that at Brown, we don't just believe, but we live values of lifelong education and we live values in the idea that this relationship between professor and student is a reciprocal one. And it may start as professor teaching student, but very quickly it becomes student teaching professor and vice versa for years and sometimes decades to come. I just love the fact that you're going to see that, I'm sure, in the discussion today. So let me quickly introduce our panelists. We'll start from my immediate left. Rima Lili is a 1994 Brown graduate. She's corporate vice president and deputy general counsel in the competition and market regulation group at Microsoft. That's the group that's tasked with helping the company, helping Microsoft comply with competition laws and market regulation around the world, secure regulatory clearance and approval of mergers and acquisitions, and respond to competition investigations and enforcement actions. In addition to her work with Microsoft, Rima is a longstanding advocate for diversity and inclusion, as well as for civil legal aid. Uh, she's worked with local and national organizations to provide access to justice for those in need, and she currently serves as a member of the Board of Directors for the Endowment for Equal Justice. Next, Angel Bruner, uh, also a 1994 Brown graduate and a first-gen college student. I, and I, I should add, Brown for decades, of course, has had first-gen students, but that community in recent years is, I think, increasingly recognized as such a critical component of our learning and our diversity here at Brown. It's a growing community and one that we've really embraced here at Watson and Brown more generally. So Angel, in addition to graduating from Brown in 1994, since then has become the CEO of EB5 Capital, which is an $800 million commercial real estate investment firm, which connects foreign investors with job creating projects designed to fulfill the requirements of the EB5 immigration, uh, immigrant investor program. Prior to founding EB5 Capital, uh, Angel held various senior management roles in finance, including at Fannie Mae and National, Ca and, uh, National Capital Revitalization Corporation. Angel's widely recognized nationally, globally, as a leader in economic development and impact investing. She's also a trustee of the Brown Corporation and a member of the Watson Board of Governors. Malika Sadasar, Brown class of 1992, is a human rights lawyer who serves as YouTube's global head of human rights partnerships. 
uh, leading the platform's efforts in working alongside activists, nonprofits, and external partners to advance human rights issues, including in areas of criminal justice reform, gender equality, and, and racial justice. Malika had previously served as Google's senior counsel on civil and human rights. Prior to her time at Google, Malika was leader in, a leader in the nonprofit community. Uh, she founded and served as executive director of both Rights for Girls and the Rebecca Project for Human Rights. And she also served on the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS during the Obama administration. Malika, in the coming year, will be joining Watson as a senior fellow and teaching our students. Again, the reciprocal relationship between teachers and, and students. Eileen Shai is uh, a graduate of the Brown class of 1996. She's a senior partner in the New York office of Bain and Company. Eileen has over 20 years of experience in strategy consulting um, and is a leader in Bain's global consumer products practice. Eileen has also been a leader of Bain's social impact efforts, including founding the New York Bain's Care Chapter and leading multiple pro bono case teams, along with authoring articles on education policy. Uh, Eileen is a former member of the Board of Uncommon Schools and a current member of the Leadership Now Project, a membership organization of business professionals taking action to protect American democracy. What an extraordinary panel. So let, let's get things going. We're going to do this very informally. But, but I guess the first question I have for you all is, how do you think your Brown education influenced, if at all, your professional life subsequently, particularly the manner by which you engaged various kinds of public policy issues. Anybody want to start? I can start. Go ahead, Angel. <laughs> so uh, while I was here, I focused on urban policy. I focused on low-income housing and, and AIDS prevention in low-income populations, and I worked in South Providence. And South Providence was the first place I saw a vibrant working class community that had no services, no banks, no grocery stores, no good schools, lots of hardworking people and no services. And and that directly, that's a that's not a dotted line, that's a that's a solid line to what I do now, which is um, rebuild urban neighborhoods by uh, creating neighborhoods with urban infill. So it's it's just a direct line for me. Fantastic. Um, I'll follow up. Oh, go ahead. Sure. Um, so when I was here, uh, there was a, a very strong sense of um, the student body believing in moral obligation. What is your responsibility as a student to making the universe that we are part of better? What is the responsibility of Brown to the, the arc of justice? Um, and that, I think, shaped me more than anything, to know a community and to be part of an environment in which your belief in doing justice in the world was honored. And that as a learner, you, you shaped your learning process around doing right, doing justice. Um, and and I, I want to start our panel uh, in terms of Professor Chait, because uh, for me, coming into this university, um, feeling very scared, um, very uh, otherized, um, Professor Chait was the one who said, you have to stand in your truth, no matter how hard that might be. And the way that he mentored me and so many others in standing in our truth, that's what allows me to walk into a corporate space like Google and have conversations around what is our moral obligation? How do we bend the arc of justice? It is not, I speak a language and a mindset that is different than how many of our corporations move. And being able to do that with clarity and groundedness is because Professor Chait and this institution taught me how to stand in my truth regardless of how frightening that might be, regardless of how hard I have to fight to do that. I would um, build on, on what Malika said, uh, because I, I completely agree with that. I don't have a straight line <laughs> um, in, in my career. Um, but very much my experience at Brown was an inspiration. 
Um, both in two respects. I absolutely agree with sort of that notion of being in a community where one's moral obligations and questions of social justice and what is your impact um, and what is the legacy that you are leaving and how are you creating a better place, um, you know, to leave this world a better place um, when you're done with it. And I think that was something that was very much inspired by my time at Brown and by all the brilliant students and professors um, that I had the chance to work with. And then I, I think secondly on that front, you know, the, the whole notion of public policy and this place where sort of politics came together with sort of the rich world of, of governance and, and you had this opportunity to really explore, bring these things to life and find out how they actually did impact people, how you did make change, what policy choices mattered um, and how they mattered and how you could make a difference. Those were tools that I learned here um, and that I carried through, I ultimately became a lawyer. Um, but that sort of that um, that notion that you can actually drive change, um, whether through the law or pure policy tools, was one that kind of I began to learn and explore here. Yeah, I, I like uh, like Rima. I think my line is less less sort of solid between my policy uh, studies here and my pr current professional life. But I would I sort of agree with you that. Two things. One is I think the Brown education meant that through my entire professional life, I can always, I'm always sort of thinking about sort of the broader systems in which mm -hmm. the, the sort of corporation or the, you know, the, the company that I'm advising, you know, what it sort of exists within. I think that's gotten even much more interesting over the last few years as mm -hmm. the intersections between policy and, and government have become more, um, just the, there's been more overlap. The other thing is, you know, outside of that is Brown really taught me to think. Like this is the place where I feel like I learned to think critically and think deeply, and you know, even if that the specific topics I wasn't learning, I, I sort of uh, spent time on at Brown weren't necessarily what I work on now. That you know, deep ability to sort of to think critically, to write, to read critically, to engage with others in a sort of thoughtful exchange. I think that's you know very much been a part of my professional mm -hmm. career. I would like to draw two more lines. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rima and I shared constitutional law here, <laughs> and it really influenced us in, mm -hmm. in big ways. You went on to law school, I, yeah. I didn't. Mm -hmm. And then Malika and I shared uh, what became the largest protest and arrest mm -hmm. in Ivy League history here uh, for need blind admissions. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was transformational. And when I was elected to the corporation, and I say elected because I wasn't invited into the room, you guys voted me into the room. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> when I walked into the corporation room, uh, I thought, wow, this place looks familiar. Mm. And it was because the last time I was there, it was because we were sitting in and kicking out the administration. Mm. And in my first discussion as a trustee, it was for need blind for international students. Mm. And I found myself again standing up for what I learned to believe in. So, And, and I just want to add to that that for me that moment when we took over University Hall for need blind admissions the students were supportive but we faced a lot of criticism from members of the faculty and administration um, and I had moments of being uh, in a place of really thinking through do we do the right thing should, mm -hmm. you know, should we have taken over University Hall should we have framed our conversation and argument differently around need blind admissions and Professor Chait <laughs> came to me and um, gave me Saul Alinsky's biography mm -hmm. and I remember that that sense of what we did was correct and again, in those moments that you have later in your professional career of, is it right for me to stand up in this way? Did, did I carve the argument correctly? Um, for me, I always lean back on that moment, that very formative moment of that protest movement where we were criticized and understanding that we were right, that we um, later, years later, had yeah. pr President Simmons reinforce that we were right and saying that now this institution will be need blind. Um, I think that those moments that this university gives you and certain professors give you in reassuring you that those hard decisions made out of courage are what is foundational to a commitment professionally of moving in the direction of rights and dignity.
striking to me that what 30 years ago was a, a radical idea, perhaps mm -hmm. not welcomed by everybody in the community, today is a completely, not just normal, but need-blind admissions is fundamental to our identity. And the idea of extending need-blind admissions to international students, I think, is also not a particularly controversial. It just seems an obvious thing to do, which is remarkable. And I, I thank you for, for um, making that a normal piece of our identity, an important piece of our identity. I want to pick up on something, Eileen, that you mentioned about how there may not be a completely linear path from your undergraduate education to your professional life, but that there are connections and that this relationship between business and government has become incredibly complex mm -hmm. and deep. So I, I would ask you and everybody else in the panel maybe to give us, um, give me an anecdote, but an example of a, a personal success, a professional success, or at least an experience that underscores the complexity of this relationship and the possibility maybe of affecting change. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as somebody, so I, I advise um, big companies and, and CEOs specifically, and the last, what I would say for that group of people is the last 10 years in particular, I think the last decade has been a time of really coming to terms with how much you can't, I don't think, as a business leader, sort of stand apart from society or stand apart from societal <clears throat> implications, and they've just become such a deep part of who you know, sort of what my clients are sort of thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. A couple, couple things come, you know, first of all, you know, the, you know, George Floyd murder, after that, that murder, you know, most CEOs, you know, you can't walk in, how do you walk into work the next day? How do you talk to your, your people who are almost by definition a very diverse set of people that are wrestling with this very, you know, you know, traumatic event in different ways? And sort of CEOs, are say, most CEOs that I talk to say, that was one of the most difficult, you know, I've, you know, leadership events that I've ever been through because I had to lead in this way that I wasn't really trained for as a CEO. I wasn't, you know, I didn't. This is what this is what they, they teach you at business school, and so um, so sort of trying to sort of work with my clients. That's sort of one thing that I would talk about is how do you sort of you know, as leaders start to show up in new, you know, just the the world is starting to challenge business leaders in ways where you can't. You can't you can't stand apart from it. You can't just sort of say that's happening on the outside and, and we're on the inside. It just doesn't work like that. That's not the world. Um, uh, anyway, that, that's one big thing. Another thing that's that's really you know becoming to life now is sustainability and uh, for businesses like what is our role in climate change? More and more, we again we can't stand apart from it. And so starting to think pretty deeply and syst systemically about how you know I as a large corporation can reach back into my sort of supply chain and work with farmers in a different way, work with, you know, recycling initiatives in a different way, work with, there's all sorts of things that now businesses are thinking about in this very, you know, sort of unique way that's been, anyway, for me it's been inspiring and sort of fulfilling to be part of, to all of a sudden see these things that I worked on so many years ago back at Brown now become very much part of the present um, because they are, they're sort of infiltrating the business community in terms of things that we just can't, we can't ignore as business leaders anymore. So it's been a, a very interesting decade. I find Great. it sort of fascinating. So, Thanks. Yeah. You can jump around. Rima, did you want to? Um, I, I think one of the things that's interesting about corporations today is just the role of employees. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think we see at Microsoft quite often is that our employees are very vocal. Um, and expect that the company will take positions um, and will have something to say on the yeah. issues of the day. And I don't, it's, it's hard to know whether that's sort of a generational thing um, or it is, it's probably a combination of both generational, but as well as just a frustration with government um, and the inability of government to solve problems. Uh, and quite frankly, some of the, the growing sort of economic power and influence of, of corporations that they can actually do things mm -hmm. um, and, and affect change. Um, one of the things is I think about just kind of lessons learned, um, you know, we do a lot of work. Um, I end up doing a lot of work um, with government on kind of policy issues. As we think about um, all of that, uh, I, I think one of the things that's become so important, so clear to me as we do this work is how, how you need to sort of ground yourself in a set of principles and values on any given issue um, so that you're not just reacting to kind of the moment of the day but to really have a, a strong point of view, uh, a set of principles around a particular problem, and then you as a company need to act um, for yourself, right? So if you enunciate, hey, here's what we ought to do, 
then we ought to be able, we ought to be willing to do it ahead of government telling us to do it, right? And that also has to involve a little bit of sacrifice and pain. <laughs> Because if you as a corporation, if your policy prescriptions or your advice is really only to benefit you, um, you don't have credibility. Uh, and in fact, you're probably not driving the right kind of change out there. And so you need to have those hard conversations internally um, and allow yourself to be kind of value-led and principle-led and then go about and start making the change in the world. Uh, and then others will follow, including government. The, my, my experience has been uh, twofold. One, I, I tried to work in government and both times, quasi-government, both times I was called in by either my boss or my boss's boss's boss <laughs> and uh, told, told that my pace was upsetting people. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I felt like I was working on some things that were rather urgent. So. Um, so it didn't work out for me, the whole employee route. So I started my own company, and now everyone works at my pace. Uh, I have no attrition. We're celebrating 15 years. It took us 15 years to get to a billion dollars and 2,000 families. It'll only take us five more years to get to 4,000 families and $2 billion. We've created over 35,000 jobs. We've had clients from 75 countries. Um, my competitors usually have clients from about 20. And it's because... Uh, we're just a very values-driven company. And I joke that I'm going to have to do a TED Talk on how to keep millennials because <laughs> they don't quit. They love what they do. But it's because we've wrapped the whole thing together. We're 100% private sector, but when I tell people what we do, they think we're a nonprofit mm -hmm. because we're so values-driven. And that was always very easy for me. Um, it's resulted in some, you know, depending on how you look at it, I'm either values-driven or... Um, I'm an agitator, depending. Uh, I sue Homeland Security a lot. Um, <laughs> I win all the time. Uh, we are the only immigration program to ever be reinstated by Congress, uh, which I didn't know when I was fighting for it. It's probably good no one told me that. Um, so we just, we're very principled. We're small, but we're very principled. We help it, um, entrepreneurial or, or, or middle-class immigrants come to the United States through investment. And then when things happen, like uh, the earthquake in Turkey or whatnot, we always you know, donate on the human trafficking side or, or on the uh, forced migration side and stuff. And so uh, the employees just feel very fulfilled just by doing their day job, which is fun. So I feel like I'm part of a pioneering generation of human rights lawyers in the corporate space. Mm -hmm. um, and I argue that, that they need us desperately because corporate spaces have as much influence over human rights standards as civil society, as government, and sometimes more. Um, and, and I think it's important to talk about what, what it means <clears throat> to be a human rights lawyer in, in the Google space. Um, Angel was like, wait, let me put this together. You're at Google and you're doing human rights. I don't understand, <laughs> which is usually the response. Um, it's been very important for me to structure the work not in philanthropy, right? So mm -hmm. Google has what we call .org, which is our philanthropy um, part. And there's the, the, um, the structural inclination to put the work of human rights in philanthropy, and I was very insistent that this work belongs in government and public affairs. Um, and that is how it first has been structured, that we have a human rights presence in government and public policy. So making sure that we are not knowingly, unknowingly complicit with um, child slavery, with forms of modern day slavery in our supply chains. But it has also become part of the work of how do we align ourselves in terms of our technologies, our platform, our products with human rights movements. So one example of that that I'm very proud of is uh, we worked with the criminal justice reform community to make sure that the bail bond industry, which has historically exploited poor communities, is not able to advertise on search. Right? So we pulled all of the ads for bail bonds off of search because it is a predatory business, especially for impoverished communities and communities of color. 
Um, and then the other piece in terms of like active use of our products, I mean, I, I argue that this is a human rights tool, right? Mm -hmm. That that this, it, George Floyd, right? We, mm -hmm. we have these smartphones that serve us to be in connection with one another, to take great pictures, but they are also human rights tools. Um, and being able to give human rights organizations access to our company to think through how to use these products and platforms and technologies to advance human rights work. And a very concrete recent example of that is being able to um, work with um, individuals who were incarcerated as children mm -hmm. in this country to tell their stories of incarceration using VR technology. So you can actually, um, through VR, you are in first person and you are experiencing what it's like to be in a prison cell as a child. So you look at your hands, and they're children's hands. They're not your hands. You feel the largeness of that prison cell using the VR technology. Um, another example was being able to tell the stories of women rights defenders all over the world using augmented reality as a way of illustrating what they are fighting for, again, so that it comes alive, so it animates the work of a woman rights defender. And you have access to that, whether you are um, in Uganda or in Utah. The ability to really uh, have connection to rights defenders using our products and technology. So those are the ways that I'm, I'm proud of the work that we're doing because it's not isolated and tethered to doing good in terms of philanthropy. It is part of how we think about our policies, whether it's supply chains or predatory businesses, um, as well as being able to give active use and connection to human rights organizations and defenders to use our technologies to advance their work. Thank you. In just a moment, we're gonna open it up to, to uh, discussion with you all. So get your questions ready, and it doesn't have to be just questions, comments, perspectives, your own stories as well. I, I want to maybe ask one last question that picks up a little bit, Malik, on what you were referencing with respect to really embracing new technologies to fight for, for change. So the, this question is a little bit more forward-leaning, thinking about the future. You know, I, I think about obvious societal challenges we face, whether it's climate change or challenges of equity and challenges of delivering health care. Across the board, we face all these challenges. And there's huge technological transformation. I think much of it positive, but some of it kind of frightening. AI, machine learning are obvious examples. And then there's the political situation. I don't mean just in the US, but, but really in so many parts of the world where governments seem hamstrung and in large part because societies are so fractured. You don't have to speak to this, but the Target situation the last uh, few days, I think, is an example of this. But wh where do you think that relationship between business and government, or even more important, the ability from the private sector to affect change, where's that going in the future in the context of all of this maelstrom of confusion that, that we're living in today? Well, it's exactly my argument to law students now of why, if they are doing human rights, they have to be in the private sector and especially in technology mm -hmm. because we are at a crossroads. We know that these technologies can be weaponized against us, can be weaponized to surveil us, to take away our rights. And we also know that these technologies can be about advancing our rights and how that how that works, the direction that we take, I think is very, very influenced by who's at the table. Mm -hmm. And it's why it's so critical that individuals who come from diverse backgrounds and individuals who are human rights experts, who are human rights lawyers, are part of those conversations, are at the table. Otherwise, we will not we will not win this, right? We will see the ways in these technologies are about robbing us of dignity and our rights. I also think that 
at this at this very important crossroads that we see, um, being able to recognize that the technology is moving far quicker than policy, right? I mean, we, we see this with, with Gen AI, right? That, that this technology is moving so quickly that government cannot keep up. There's not the possibility of regulation that is on par with advancement in technology. And again, I think what becomes very critical is how do rights-based organizations hold accountable um, corporations, and how do corporations make the right decisions about who is at the table and what is the process of accountability in order to ensure that we are moving in a good, healthy direction. So let me just quickly give you an example. You know, we've been very purposeful um, at Google about saying there have to be principles around how we drive Gen AI. And human rights organizations and racial justice organizations have to be part of this conversation. Their exclusion is dangerous. Uh, and I think that's the direction that more, more of, of Google and other tech companies have to go uh, towards. And that also the human rights organizations and civil rights organizations have to be literate around these spaces to hold us all accountable. And in the in the space of policy and law, we have to hold that intersection between technology and human rights, technology and good public policy. Great. Other thoughts on the panel about what the future holds? Eileen. I, will, I was just going to say, I, so um, I don't know anywhere near as much about human rights, so I can't talk about that. But what I will say, and so let me pick another issue area, so specifically sustainability and, and climate change. We're at this place now where, for the average corporation, they're getting pressure from consumers to deliver more sustainable products. And they also have government regulation that is, in a positive way, starting to, I think in a very positive way, starting to set the bar for you know, the, the sort of sustainability credentials of, of your products. And so for most companies, they're now trying to think about, I work for consumer products companies. So this is like the you know, big food companies, big beverage companies, things like that. And they're trying to think about how do we sort of you know, deliver against these these expectations. The problem is the system doesn't function in such a way that they can. So recycling, for example, like you know, if I want to if I want to reduce the amount of plastic waste that I sort of as a company put out into the world, you need to kind of create this circular system where a plastic plastic gets recycled and then gets and then it gets reused and we reuse it again and again. The problem is recycling rates are too low. There aren't enough recycling factories. There just aren't enough. And so there is no, like this sort of circular economy of plastic doesn't work. And so what you're starting to see is companies say, you know, I have to, as a company, get in and start to kind of change that system. I actually have to reach back out into my supply chain and start to, I'm going to stand up in the recycling factory. I'm going to start to work on recycling rates in a given market. They're very different uh, kind of country by country. I'm going to start to work on recycling rates in given countries because otherwise my, I sort of can't meet the commitments. I can't meet the commitments that governments and consumers are expecting for me. And so I think this sort of, you know, sort of entrepreneurialism that traditionally has been part of the business sector, seeing that now because of the sort of new intersections between, I think, societal issues and business issues, they're starting, again, there's just, they're just starting to come together and be a single, a single thing. And as a, as a business person, it's sort of it's quite exciting to me to see businesses start to engage in this really deep, you know, sort of genuine way and, and the, these sort of issues of, you know, what's the right thing to do for our world and what's the right thing to do for my business. No, they're no longer pulling you in separate directions. They're sort of starting to pull you in the same direction. So it's, it's exciting when that starts to sort of come together, at least, at least for me. And I love that point about industries like food production, some yeah. of the oldest industries in the world that aren't associated with being, you know, so exciting and so full mm -hmm. of technology. Ex have the ability to exert so much leverage yeah. on mm -hmm. sustainability issues. It's a huge point. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of it. I sit on the board of a company that ha is a real estate company that's in 50 countries, and so much of climate change is, is, mm -hmm. is the, the built environment mm -hmm. is, is such a big culprit mm -hmm. that we're finding ourselves on the front lines. Mm -hmm. And it's great because, because we're in so many countries, we can take best practices and sort of push them through mm -hmm. our entire customer base, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. Yeah. 
yeah, globally comparative learning is a, a big deal here at Brown and at, at Watson, and it's thanks to a lot of the lessons that you're all teaching us. Rima. I, I mean, I probably most closely align with um, <laughs> Malika just because of our, um, our shared uh, industries that we're in. But I do think, I mean, the future is, is far too important to be left to engineers as much as I love them. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, you absolutely need the human rights lawyers in the room. You need all sorts of liberal arts um, folks and different perspectives that are in the room as products are being designed. I as want you guys on the product out. development team now. <laughs> <laughs> um, as products are being designed and rolled out and you start to think about and wrestle with what is their impact on different communities, both positive and negative. And I mean, I see the richness of discussion that I have at work every day that comes from so many different perspectives as we think about um, at these issues. And you can't just wait and rely on government to kind of clean up the mess. Technology does move very fast. Business, the economy generally moves very fast. And you have problems like climate change that are coming at us very fast. Uh, and so if corporations don't get in there and start making changes um, up front, yeah. uh, we're going to have a lot of problems. <laughs> so. I love that point about having people other than just the engineers in the room, yeah. just as I love the point about providing engineers a liberal arts education yeah, as well, right. and maybe teaching all of us how to make the world legible, or maybe challenge ways that other people are telling us to make the world legible. So all part of I know what you do and what we're trying to do here at Brown. L let's open it up to, to questions. I have more of my own, but I want to hear yours and your experiences. And please, if, if you're willing, introduce yourselves. Hi, uh, my name is Ram Krishnan. Uh, thank you for your comments. There seems to be a broad um, feeling that corporations are stepping beyond their boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the backlash. I don't have to talk about it. Disney, Target, Notstar. There seems to be a new one every day, right? Mm -hmm. And is it because consumers of corporations feel that they're being lectured to? And you know, I'm, I'm going to a corporation, I'm using a product for a specific purpose, for a specific you know, objective, and do you think that there is a danger in corporations being perceived as moralizing to the general community and do you see the backlash that you're seeing, which has increased significantly in the last year, a result of that miscommunication between corporations and the people that they serve? I would, I would spin it differently. I would argue that the reality is that Gen Z is the most diverse, educated, and conscientious generation we've ever seen issues of human rights, racial justice, LGBTQ rights matter to them significantly mm -hmm. more than we've seen in previous generations because of their diversity in part. I think companies recognize that they have to be more aligned with this generation to be successful because this is a generation that also will not buy your products if you aren't aligned with social justice issues. I think part of what we're seeing is that you have companies that are aligning with Gen Z and what is important to Gen Z around social justice issues. What is the emerging reality of our new demographics, which are diverse, are representative, and government that isn't always ready to recognize that same reality. So you have a lot of situations, whether it's our Supreme Court or situations of certain governors and other lawmakers that are not in step and in sync with the new America that is more diverse than we've ever seen. To their credit, many companies are recognizing that, if only to be successful in terms of a competitive edge with this Gen Z uh, reality. So I think that's the tension. I think you have corporations that are more in sync with what the country is and is becoming than uh, many of our politicians and government and Supreme Court. That's my take on it. Any other 
Any other comments on that question? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's, a difficult, it's a really difficult line for corporations to walk. Um, and I, 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 you know, there is a pressure, I was sort of mentioned earlier, internally as well. It's not just sort of what do your consumers think or what do people outside the company think. Um, but internally, I mean, we have 200,000 employees at Microsoft. They are very vocal. Mm -hmm. They want to know what the company thinks or what the company is doing on this Supreme Court decision or that Supreme Court decision or this policy or that policy. Um, they want to know what we're doing for sustainability and are we doing enough. Um, and so as a company, it's, it is hard to manage you know, and to think about where do we speak, where is it appropriate for us to speak and to act. In some cases, you know, our business, as Eileen was saying, you know, it, you know, we're a big consumer of energy. We have a big impact there. We need to be involved in the sustainability conversation regardless. Um, so you, you definitely need to be active in that space, but are there other spaces where you don't, you aren't as active because you, know, you shouldn't be speaking just to speak. Right. Um, but you have to be thoughtful. I think corporations have to be thoughtful about where they're speaking up, where they're not, where they're amplifying voices, where they stay quiet. Um, and it's not a muscle, quite frankly, that CEOs are taught in business school. Um, so it's important that those human rights lawyers are in the room. <laughs> so, so Monica, to the point, right? So you're saying corporations are ahead of uh, governments aligning themselves. But corporations are not you know, elected representatives, right? So, you know, governments are the elected representatives. I mean, they are the ones who face election and they reflect the uh, flawed or not the popular vote of the consumers and of the citizens, right? So, do you think we get into a tension where corporations are promoting policy objectives when they are not elected, when, you know? Maybe a quick response and then we'll go to the other. Uh, I'll take that. Uh, what I would say is it, it potentially is exactly the opposite, that every time a consumer makes a purchase, they're voting, mm -hmm. and so they're voting every day. And every time an employee goes to work, like as a CEO, I tell my employees, I'm so proud of the fact that you choose me every day. Every day you make the choice to work for me. So I think that's what Rima and Malika are really talking about. Their employees make that choice every day. And if they don't get the politics right, their employees are gonna make a different choice. And the mm -hmm. consumers are gonna make a different choice too. So when you vote for a government, you vote intermittently. When you vote as a consumer, you vote every day. Great, thank you. Let's go to the next question. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm an old grad, very old, class of 62. Um, but back. Over, thank you. Um, but over the years, I've seen a lot of changes in the, uh, the whole attitude on campus. I mean, I, I envy you for being on campus when you were in the 80s and 90s uh, to get involved in these things. These things were happening. In, in my days, we behaved ourselves. <laughs> in fact, I think that my, my worst uh, experience was I uh, one day wrote a letter to the Providence Journal, which was published, criticizing the Providence Police Department. Mm. Now, do you think anybody gave me a pat on the back? No, all I got was a visit to Dean Durgan. <laughs> <laughs> he accused me of being the pot calling the kettle black. I said, Dean, maybe you have to be a pot to know when the kettle is black. Mm -hmm. I was not a very nice guy. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> getting back to the theme of the uh, talk here today, uh, the relationship between business and government. Uh, it, it seems we we're talking about the industry has to promote human rights. Because it seems in government these days, uh, there seems to be a, a very narrow focus on denying human rights, at least from a certain segment that gets has a very loud megaphone. Um, I think it's a, it, on one hand, it seems to be a shame when business knows more about what's happening in government than the legislators. Mm -hmm. but but. Uh, and then people say we need term limits to get rid of some of the legislators. That just puts more ignorance in the legislature. Uh, I, I think we need more. Uh, I think we need more brown people in the legislature and fewer Yaleys. <laughs> A lot fewer Yaleys. <laughs> but no, I think you're doing some wonderful things out there. And I'd just like to see uh, some more getting involved in government. And, and how do we get better people in government to pass better laws? As you said, the legislators pass the laws but they're doing some pretty silly things right now. So, any comments on that? Thank you. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> well, I think, again, the private sector needs to be more involved. I just had a situation where Congress killed my program, and we were out of business for two years. And I, my industry looked to me for the leadership to rewrite the legislation, get it reauthorized, and I did it. And, uh, and that was a volunteer, you know, that was just raising my hand and doing it. So I think the public sector, the private sector, and, and citizens need to be more involved in the laws that govern us. Does anybody have any comments on the issue of wh when people are moving back and forth between the public sector and the private sector, there are many positive aspects to that, but there's also the potential for conflict of interest and regulatory capture, th these kinds of things. And how have you in your careers either ba made that balance or witnessed it in either a positive or negative way? I, I feel pretty strongly about this. Yeah. Um, just because of my experiences in the antitrust and competition space, we deal with competition regulators around the world, and there is a marked difference between um, you know some of our experiences you know in the U.S. versus in Europe, um, where they have very strict laws against people moving back and forth um, between the between government and private sector, and I actually I think it's the greatest thing. <laughs> Um, I, you know, if I, as I, you know, when I speak to students um, and folks who are early in their career, you know, one of my biggest regrets is that I did not spend time in government. I think it is incredibly valuable, and I don't understand how you can be effective, to your point about how we get better people in government, if you do not enable people to collect a different experiences, to have different perspectives, so that they can understand both sides. And, and actually work much more effectively both from a process and a substance point of view. Now, you absolutely have to be careful about things like regulatory capture and conflicts of interest, and there are rules that can be put in place to help manage that. Um, but you need people in government that understand private sector and have the experiences and work at an urgent pace and can bring that into the government. Um, and you need the reverse. You need people in companies that also understand what the government is trying to achieve, what their incentives are, what some of their constraints are, so that they can work effectively and build strong partnerships. So I, I think it's invaluable, to be quite honest. Great. Any other thoughts? Super. Yes. Hi, good morning. I'm Steve Chasse. And uh, I'm slightly younger than the last uh, graduate who spoke, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I definitely feel old. Uh, I want to start off by saying uh, 30 years ago, you know, if I would have been in a, a forum at Brown University, uh, we would not have had four uh, female panelists in the front of the room. Um, so I'm really, uh, re really great to, uh, I'm appreciative to see you four up there. Um, I don't know, maybe it's the Bernie Sanders in me. Um, but I'm having a really hard time thinking that like Bain, Microsoft, and Google are, are good corporate actors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we if you want to talk about brown values, um, you know, I don't. I guess I'm having a hard time, uh, you know, seeing that that you know companies who uh, crush their competitors. Um, you know, are good examples of, of how the economy should be run. Um, I'm not sure there's a question here, but um, uh, I guess one of the things that bothers me, and, and I, I would uh, be really excited for these ladies to address it, is uh, I was actually an economic minority at Brown. I was on financial aid, and at the time, you know, 30 years ago, um, you know, we didn't have need blind, which is in, an incredible uh, advance in development. Um, but like, f I, I think the, the, the whole social justice, I shouldn't use that phrase, the whole social, <laughs> I, I think economic justice, um, you know, if people can't afford to send their kids to Brown, or if people can't afford to put food on their table, or, I mean, you talk about choices. I don't know, like, do I have a choice besides Microsoft or Google? Like, a, a, an economic choice? When you talk about, um, you know, consumer choices, um, I don't know if these large corporations are exact, doing anything to advance economic justice. 
So sometimes I feel like the, the social justice thing is a distraction um, because the real difference is when you know, people are able to live better and we're focusing on livable wages and we're focusing on you know, e economic growth for people at the bottom. Um, so if you want to comment on any of that, that's fine. Um, and you know, again, it was great to see all of you up there. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, okay, I'll stop there, but uh, <laughs> hopefully we get some younger presidential candidates in the future. Like, Angel, I think you should run for president. <laughs> Wait till you hear how I respond to your comments. <laughs> so, but I'll, you know, so, I'll say cha challenging, challenging power. So, uh, and spirited discourse is also very much part of yeah, Brown's yeah, values. Absolutely. So, so the uh, panel. So we've, we've kind of gotten into, I'm a futurist. I, have, I feel like I have to come out about that. Like, you know, we can joke about coming out, but I always have to come out as a futurist <laughs> because, because it really frames a lot of the way I think about things. So for me, the thing that keeps me up at night is that wages and the cost of living are completely untethered right now. If we're just honest with ourselves. And, and companies like Google and Microsoft and Bain, they all have futurists. I don't know one government that hires a futurist. And I don't know one company that changes its CEO every four years and calls it a good idea. So I know we all love democracy, but we're going to have to figure out a different, longer term way to think about our problems. Because it's not fair to corporations because it's not fair to consumers. Because when I charge a corporation, they're going to charge you. And it's not, so it's not fair to corporations to say that their wages have to support what we believe is a minimum standard of living. And until we start talking about the real issues, which is that wages have untethered from housing and education and cost of food, and how are we going to solve that as a society, we're going to continue to blame corporations for things that aren't their fault and aren't their problems. So I just want to respond in, in, in addition. Um, first, the idea that all four of us are up here as women and women of color. I want to give honor to Professor Chite because he is part of that. It is no mistake that we are the ones that feel so deeply mentored by him and supported by him, uh, that, that Professor Chite was a safe and, and kind and supportive uh, presence for us as students. So I, th I think it's, there's a connection between Professor Chite and who we are and being here. Um, I, I also, um, I invite everything that you have said um, I, you know, if, if you had told me when I was uh, uh, a law student doing human rights law that I would wind up at Google, I would have been like, you are out of your mind. Why, why would I ever fight for justice in the context of a corporation? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it is exactly because I am the outlier voice that I have to be at these companies, right? It is exactly why human rights lawyers have to be in these spaces because we are the outliers. So and I tell students that. now, don't leave the room right. with your anger. Don't leave the room. Stay in the room and force the conversation in the room. Do not leave the room. And reshape the conversation. Yeah. Because if we're not in the room, then we're not shaping and reshaping the conversation. And it's hard. I'm not going to act like this is easy and it's you know fantastic doing this work in these spaces. It's incredibly difficult because we're trying to reshape the conversation. And it's not always a conversation that in the, at the end of the day, we are successful in reshaping. But we have to be there. I, I don't know if anyone else on this panel's had this experience, but never once in my professional life have I ever been in a room with anyone that looks like me, ever. Good boy. I've never been in a room with anyone that looks like me, ever, in my entire professional life, not even in my own company. Let that sink in for a minute. Mm -hmm. When I tell you to stay in the room, I tell you from experience, stay in the room. Thank you. Are there comments? Well, look, we well, actually, let's do this. We, we're pretty much at the end of the hour, but let's do one more question and a super quick responses, and then we'll just continue the conversation at our reception outside. Please. Great. Thanks for the 
letting one last question slip in. I'm Willow Darcy. I'm class of 1998. And your opening comments about the responsibility to make change really landed with me. I think Barton Gregorian had a big influence maybe in the, <laughs> our, our decade of, of, of uh, yeah. students. Um, but my question, um, I work in values-based leadership. And so a lot of what you, all of what you've spoken about uh, you know, fits in that space. Um, but really specifically, I want to drill down on Rima mm -hmm. um, and others. Please feel free to comment. But how to make values um, not just be kind of that the 1950s style, mm -hmm. like very paternalistic leader of a corporation or any organization, very top down, um, you know, and, and, and flip that utterly on its head and engage with employees um, to have that inquiry, that dialogue, um, you know, to help vi values be sourced, refreshed, enlivened, um, and, and kind of engage from, with all levels of your diverse workforces. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I, I, do you want to, I, do you want to go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it's, it's a, I think this is one of the most interesting things over the past few years is, uh, is at least at, at, at my company at Bain, is how do we, create dialogues that are real authentic dialogues across the workforce. And so what we've started to do, this is just sort of one experience, but we have these, they're called brave spaces. So brave spaces conversations and it will be any any given project team um, over the course of, we, we do these sort of project-based pieces of work. Well, we'll have a brave spaces conversation. And what they do is usually it's junior employees, often of color or people, but not always, um, Leading, a, leading the conversation, and it'll be a conversation about what is a societal issue that our work is addressing. So, you know, it could be, um, you know, sort of, you know, what is the diversity of the advertising that, that my company is putting forward? It could be about sustainability, but some sort of societal issue that the work we're doing with the company is addressing. And ha have a, the Brave Spaces is, Let's all talk about really authentically what this means, you know, to us. We, you know, more and more, like our workforce is very diverse. It's, you know, we hire to be, you know, uh, you know, sort of intentionally to create, particularly the junior levels, very um, kind of diverse people. And so you have these very authentic conversations about, you know, I, you know, I am a first generation, you know, college graduate, or for, you know, and and here is what this means to me and how I experience this particular issue in a way that is different from. From you, and it's been incredibly powerful. And it's not something we would have done ten years, or we would, you sort of would have even thought to do ten years ago. Would have been, you know. But and yeah, so I think there are ways in which those conversations. I'm sure we're not the only ones. I'm sure you guys have experiences at your workplaces. But anyway. Yeah, I want to. I want just want to add two things. To that one for me, diversity is the Star Wars cantina. I mm -hmm. feel, and and I think maybe it's always only being the only one in the room that I've gotten to look at diversity differently. And so I see diversity where other people don't, and I see diversity where you can't see it, yeah. right? And I feel like everyone who goes to Brown is a, is a superhero in that way, or a secret weapon, because you might look like a white male, but you have politics that are, you know, better than mine, or whatever, you know? And so I really feel like the Brown values are so important in every room and every conversation and that we're our own form of diversity in that way, in, in no matter what we look like. Um, we, in our values, are a, a level of diversity. And then I, I do want to share a point about first generation. I, I say that it took my family two generations to recover from becoming African American, because my grandmother immigrated from the Caribbean here, and all of my cousins from the Caribbean are all PhDs, first doctors, first dentists. And when she emigrated here and she married an African-American, they, you know, drugs, everything. And it took us two generations for me to get a college degree. Um, as you think about values in leadership, I think, and, and in companies, I do think that second word is really important, leadership. Like, it has to start at the very top. Like, the CEO, the head, the sort of senior leadership team, they have to believe in those values, they have to act in those values, they have to keep them as a touchstone, and they have to do that consistently over time. Not when it's easy, but also when it's hard. Because if they don't do that, they don't talk it, they don't show it, they don't role model it, 
no one below, below them will believe it. Um, and so to me, as I've watched our own company um, undergo, I think, a bit of a transformation over the last seven years since we've had a new CEO, that has been the difference. And it's made a, it's been a huge difference. I join you in that. And I would say this issue of values of representation, of equity in corporate spaces will only intensify mm -hmm. after the SCOTUS decision on affirmative action, because most likely affirmative action at the higher ed level will be dismantled fully or to some significant degree. And the, the pressure now will be on corporations around our commitment to representation and equity. Um, and I do think that uh, I, ha I have faith and belief in Gen Z's in terms of making sure that they hold these corporations responsible for that commitment to representation and equity. And everything that Brown is about in terms of our values will matter more in how we prepare this generation to go into the corporate spaces and to be those voices of conscience and light and values. Wow, thank you. What a, what a learning experience for me. I have the privilege of being at this lectern, but the real privilege is being able to learn from all of your comments and insights. Let me just say a few quick thank yous. First, thank you to the Watson staff, our exceptional staff, who made this whole event possible. And I want to thank you. Well, we'll save the applause to the end. And I want to thank you all for not just listening, but participating actively in this really spirited discussion and all the senses that we talked about, of Brown values. And of course, I want to thank the panelists. Just unbelievable, the talent and brilliance of this community. Thanks for sharing that with us. And I want to close where I started with a quick word about Ross Scheidt. You know, I don't want to get into the weeds of the profession of academia, but in, in, in academia, I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> at the privilege of the lectern, in, in, in academia, you know, I think status primarily comes from the research and the, the written work that people produce, and Ross has <laughs> been an, an unbelievable, an unbelievably successful player in that dimension of, of, of academic life. But just speaking personally, as I grow older, I increasingly feel that while the research is definitely incredibly important, what really counts are the students that we send out into the world. And that we see on this panel, these professional lives live so well and so movingly, to me, underscores Ross's professional life and the absolute model of a professional life well lived with deep, deep meaning that's going to go on for generations. Now, I know that professional life isn't over, just this particular stage, but I want to applaud Ross and applaud the panelists and all of you. Thank you for this glorious event.